Hello everyone, it's 2 p.m. 1400 CT. Uh, let's start uh, our workshop today. So uh, good afternoon, good evening, and good morning to everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, one hour, 30 minute uh, second session of uh, today's workshop on road space reallocation. Uh, these workshops are part of the dissemination uh, strategy of the uh, European Commission funded MORE project. Um, my name is uh, Emmanuel Domergue. I work for UITP as the head of the governance unit and as the manager of the UITP Organizing Authorities Committee. Francesco Ripa from Police and myself will be moderating this session. Welcome, everyone. So, um, this afternoon, we will deal with the uh, question of visions of future streets for road space relocation. In this session, we will project ourselves in possible futures. And we'll be very much complementing this morning's session that dealt with the uh, government, governance and practical issues of road space reallocation. Um, the format of this session is the following. First, we have four presentations that will be made at a go by four speakers, whom I will have the pleasure to introduce to you uh, in more details a little later. Uh, those speakers are key contributors to the MOA project. And second, We'll open discussion and round table. Um, just a bit of a uh, housekeeping. Um, we just would like to uh, kindly remind you to ensure that the micro your microphone is off during the different presentations. Either uh, we would very much welcome uh, interaction with uh, our esteemed participants. Therefore, we would encourage to leave uh, any comments other in the chat or during discussion with, uh, with our audience. In addition, we'll be happy to share a few couples of polls during the, the sessions and uh, to answer them, uh, a box will appear on your screen uh, and um, alternatively, if you can't see it, you, I would recommend to check the chat. Uh, talking about uh, uh, polls and our audience, let's launch a first poll um, to find who's part of the session and what kind of organization you work for. So a pop-up box is now appearing and accessible with your mouse. Um, I can see that participants are filling up the polls. That's very good. Uh, we're gonna wait a few seconds. Excellent. There we are. So uh, quite good spread of uh, participants from uh, local and regional authorities and consultant firms, 25%. Um, transport operators, mobility service providers and NGOs and other organizations. We also have members of academia. Thanks for this. Right. Um, let me now uh, say a few words on the MORE project, um, MORE which stands for Multimodal Optimization for Road Space in Europe. So uh, as a starting point, we recognize that uh, in our urban areas and uh, on our busy streets, demand and pressure are increasing and they're increasing because of several factors. There are new modal options that are available uh, there's growing mobility uh, related sectors, deliveries, for instance, and this has been particularly important during COVID times. There's a great interest also for place related activities. What was mentioned earlier today was some consider public realm as a continuation of the living room. And there's also high density environment. But the curb and the uh, carriage way space are fixed and limited. Uh, therefore, a conflicts tend to arise. Um, how do you address this is the central, central question of the MORE project. And uh, the key focus is about the use of public realm in a more flexible and dynamic way. Space-wise, we look at the street as an ecosystem, which offers many possible opportunities. Time-wise, we have seen that uh, policy reactions to COVID-19 has helped conceptualize and implement new street design options. So to be more concrete, more is looking at urban nodes of the so-called Trans-European Network of Transport, TNTs, 
and more is focusing in particular on how traffic is spreading from outskirts into more central parts of cities and also how to how do we deal with uh, the pressure from uh, outside to the inside of cities. Members of the consortium have been working together to develop design tools and processes that will be that will enable these key routes or specific stretch of streets to be planned, replanned, designed, redesigned, managed, and remanaged in a way that make them responsive to future pressures um, in a flexible manner. To do so, um, the, the consortium of, uh, of MORE uh, has developed some tools to better uh, generate innovative design options, to engage uh, stakeholders in street redesign, um, to provide detailed micro simulation of behaviors, uh, pedestrians, for instance, and to provide comprehensive evaluation of design options. Very quickly, um, before we move on to the presentation, just uh, uh, a few words on the consortium, which involves great colleagues from academia, from consultants, NGOs, and from five cities, uh, which are located on different TNT. So we have Constanza, Romania, Budapest in Hungary, Malmö in Sweden, Lisbon in Portugal, and London in the UK. That's about it. Uh, that was the MORE project in a nutshell. More information can be found on the, the website of um, uh, MORE, which is www.roadspace.eu. I will stop sharing my screen now, and uh, I suggest that we move on to our presentations. So I have stopped sharing my screen and I would like to uh, welcome our first speaker, Lucia Cristea. So Lucia is the uh, Managing Director of the uh, European Integrated Projects in Romania, which is a consultancy firm. And Lucia Rasha provide us with a picture of future demand and demographics. And uh, Lucia will identify future road users needs. Lucia, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Manuel. Thank you very much for the introduction and for inviting me to speak to this uh, lovely uh, webinar. I, I really enjoyed the first part and I hope that uh, this uh, second part will provide uh, uh, the audience with a nice uh, insights too. Now, uh, before I start, I will have to make a, a first caveat because the research has been done prior to the, to the COVID situation. Therefore, some of the data and the information I provide you is not calibrated with the information um, uh, during COVID, let's put it like this, we can't say uh, pre or um, post COVID yet. So um, uh, I'm happy to share some consideration, first type of consideration, but the, the, the information, it's, it's, the, um, it's the before the, the COVID situation. And another uh, interesting, uh, uh, important aspect to mention, this has been done based on a very thorough research that we have done and uh, interviews and discussions with uh, with uh, city representatives, uh, road users, uh, associations and representatives, uh, different uh, specialists and experts such as uh, uh, anthropologists, uh, uh, sociologists, um, um, behavioral economists, um, future trends watcher, very important, uh, and, uh, and of course, uh, 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 um, uh, um, technicians. So I think this is, this is a very, very thorough analysis that we have done. Um, now, if we uh, first thing we have uh, to know what is the population? You know, who is the population? Who will be the uh, the, the users of uh, of our public spaces, of our road? Uh, uh, I like uh, how uh, uh, we uh, discuss it in the morning uh, uh, road ecosystems, and we have to know how we have to prepare for for the future. And especially if we are a city a city authority representative, you have to know what will be the trends in in the population 
um, um, you know, um, if it increases or decreases. So the general trend, uh, it, it is that is a decreasing anyhow with or without COVID, it decreased by in the next 20, 30 years in Europe. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, uh, making this uh, inform uh, information. Now, of course, the population uh, is influenced by the migration and uh, the rate of urbanization. We all know about the, this, uh, these uh, issues. We know that uh, the um, majority of the population lives in urban areas, but the urban areas has the pressure of migration too. You know, this is a very complicated uh, graph. I'm not entering in details here, but it gives you an idea of how are how big are the flows of uh, of uh, migration from different areas from different countries you know if, if you follow the yellow one for example it's the flow from latin america to spain for example yeah but what will be very interesting to watch is those little um, loops between different countries on the on the right um, um, lower uh, part of uh, of the circle. This shows how uh, how much the migration within Europe is happening. And as I said, you know the rural uh, uh, population is decreasing. And uh, it's very worrying. What is very uh, interesting is that uh, um, we observed that um, in during COVID uh, uh, this last year, many people tend to go outside the city. You know, tends to find, uh, if possible, accommodations uh, uh, outside the city. Another good. Uh, uh, and uh, let's say encouraging aspect is the European Commission sees the rural areas as motor for future development, and now they are at the core of uh, of their future uh, policies and strategies. Now, if you want to understand who are those users, who are the next users, you know, uh, um, of of the roads, it would be interesting if you cl cluster them somehow. We have done. Uh, a sort of uh, of uh, um, of classification or grouping them on on, um, on five years, you know, which is not a generation, but uh, provides you an idea of of uh, some age groups that you can do. But a generation are clusters of of this uh, of these groups that we have done. Why we have done this analysis, and it is not us; it's uh, the the specialists, the psychologists, and uh, the sociologists are doing this type of. Uh, and future trend watchers are are using this type of, let's say, clustering, because they have to understand the core values of this type of clusters, of this type of generations, and why they are why we are interested in this, because this gives us the information of how will be their behavior yeah and how how and especially on uh, on using uh, mobility yeah and uh if uh, what this graph shows us how big is the generations of 50s the uh, as called the uh, prime busters yeah it's uh, it's the generation uh, uh post war and it's very 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 uh very big together with the baby bloomers it uh, uh constitutes the majority of of the population and we can see how how what is the difference with the older generation post war uh, uh, immediately post war generation or war generation in fact if you we look in the future the generation will change yeah the the what you see there the line is the actual gen, uh, population once again don't uh, don't we should not consider covid and i make a consideration immediately but what is very interesting how you know you leveling uh, aspect of of the number of population irrespective of of uh, their a generation and how much the the younger generations, uh, which is more digital, we call them digital or screen agers, so they, they they see every time the screen. You know, it's it's growing, and how the new generations uh, are are uh, um, very digital, and it's a normality for them compared with the uh, with the baby bloomers or prime busters that they are digital. Call uh, as trend watcher call them uh, digital migrants. So in other words, that they weren't born with with uh, with this uh, technology, but they have to adjust to them. I put a circle there. Why is very important because the population is aging, and that this characteristics is very important for us. Although the <clears throat> apologies, although this population this has the characteristics of being healthy and staying healthy and looking healthy and trying to find all the ways to stay more healthy. You know, this generation is decreasing and is um, um, uh, in health and is it's quite numerous. 
data. Now, I'm not insisting very much on this. This only illustrates to you how, um, how a, uh, what is the uh, a population, the age of the population in, in Europe. Again, it's in um, um, a few years already, this, uh, this, uh, 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 this study, but it shows you the propensity of, of certain type of uh, age of population in certain areas. Uh, the yellow uh, part is much more older, yeah, uh, uh, um, population, and you can see then western part of Europe is very is quite older, yeah, compared with uh, with uh, um, east part of Europe and so on, and uh, certain uh, certain uh, uh, other areas. This this is a fact of of the migration, of course, but is also of the aging that we have set. I think this is the most interesting part of the of the discussion because when we look at the generation we try to understand which are the core values and how will influence the lifestyle for for core for them and one of the characteristics that we have uh, uh, seen in in uh, our analysis it's this uh, as called somewhere versus anywhere why we say this one because uh, with the technology, especially younger uh, um, population uh, that are very digital, they are very, you know, they can live, uh, live anywhere, yeah? And this is very interesting, whether the somewhere, you know, is very important for the older generation. They have to have their comfort, they have to have their immediate accessibility to places that they like or to, to health and so on. So this is a very important aspect of, of uh, observed uh, at this moment, yeah? We can live anywhere on top of the mountain or uh, in any country that we want, but so, uh, as uh, young pe pe persons, but the, the older persons would prefer to stay uh, closer to home. It's an increased percentage of uh, disabled population. We saw uh, in other uh, graphs before that the, the population is increasing and uh, year by year, the, the orders, for example, for uh, disabled accessories, for disabled persons accept accessories, it's increasing. It is a study made by eBay, the 20% uh, increase yearly of this type of request. Um, trending places and rise of the progressive province. I think this is an, an, a trend that it, it is very much observed in Western part of Europe, but in certain parts of, of Eastern Europe, you, you, you can see it. What does it mean, this uh, uh, trending uh, places? It means that, um, uh, a, a, um, um, creative, uh, creative uh, generations. You know, younger generations would like more space. Would like, uh, um, they don't have a large income, but they would like to have a better life. So therefore, they prefer to live outside the cities. But when they move outside the cities, they, they would like to have their lifestyle from the city. Yeah, so therefore, they would like to have the same amenities, they have the same uh, uh, pleasure, that everything that they have had in, in, the, in the cities, they would like to de do, um, to have in the, in, the, in the province or in a rural area. This is progressive uh, uh, um, uh, province uh, principle. Trading place means that the, the, the older generations that lived in, in in these places in uh, peri-urban and uh, uh, rural areas. Now they tend to move back to the cities for two reasons. Either they are in, uh, empty nest, <laughs> you know, the uh, children left and they are two persons in a large home and they want to be, uh, you know, in a smaller place and therefore they move in the city. Or they would like to get to, uh, let's say, um, places that they would like to be in a yeah, theater, near yeah, opera, near yeah, other places in, 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 in very vibrant cities. These vibrant cities, the sociologists and the, the, the future trend users are, call them yogurt uh, cities. The make of so vibrant, lots of culture there. So this type of exchange between generations is happening. Micromobility, I'm not entering into the discussion because my colleagues have uh, talked uh, extensively in the morning and I think it's an issue that is tackled and is recognized very much by everybody. Uncoupled society, again, is very interesting. Again, twofold. Uh, um, uh, one, because uh, there are many, many um, accommodations in urban areas that are lived solely, so it's occurred by single persons, you know. I have somewhere, somewhere so, yeah, 34% of the houses in an urban area are lived by uh, one person, you know, this is at the end of uh, 2019, 2018, 2019. 
Now, this is very interesting because if, if, if uh, again, somebody calls them, uh, they don't share the um, laundry basket with anybody. This is one aspect. Uh, second aspect is that uh, there are um, uh, family, single, uh, single parent families, and we observed a very much an increase of, of, of this type of, uh, of families. Technology. I'm not entering in the technology aspects because many of my colleagues will discuss about the development in technologies and how they influence the mobility. But I touched upon technology to uh, discuss how it will influence the behavior. Yeah. So a few a uh, few technologies are influencing the behavior, such as the internet. You know, not only the access but the coverage. And nowadays we know that the 5G uh, network is very important because it allows us access and it's it's already considered by European Commission an, an engine, a tool for, for progress and the member states, not, yeah, not only the European Commission and strategy, but member states, is the, the ownership of the smartphone, the internet of things, of course, the, the 3D printing technology and other technologies such as augmented reality. How this will influence the work we have seen in the last uh, last uh, last year, we we see this this uh, information that it was pre COVID, you know, and uh, when uh, uh, this inform uh, this uh, um, um, statistics of or survey uh, offers us the information that the majority of workers and uh, employees and um, employers. Uh, would like to think in a different way to facilitate the teleworking and the uh, um, uh, third places usage will influence the way we will do shopping yeah and this is uh, this is something that especially the younger generation will will uh, will benefit yeah you can have an, a device that uh, scans the, your body and the next day you have the products that you want we saw uh, this one uh, this picture is from when it was uh, testing this uh, this uh, little creature you know that we see now and on the streets is part of our life nowadays and it's very important for us to to understand as we discussed earlier in the morning mario and the others how it, how it will be uh, its role on uh, on the streets and of course, it influenced the health. We saw today, uh, this year, we all have been the, let's say, uh, the beneficiary of telehealth. Yeah, and we had an, an, um, a medical consultation through internet or through phone or something like this. And this may influence very much the way we are behaving, the way we are accessing the facilities. This is, again, very important from transport point of view. How will influence us socially? Yes, we move, uh, we create this digital uh, uh, aspect. We move from, from, uh, so from um, uh, um, let's say physical space to virtual space. And this may have benefits, yeah? It may have the possibility to substitute different type of trips uh, and will, uh, um, you know, will supplement different trips that we wouldn't have been able to to do. We are talking now, yeah. We are uh, you are uh, substituting, uh, sub have the substitution of a, of a trip, you know, and uh, this is this is great. In terms of uh, of um, um, other benefits of uh, of perceived benefits of of. Uh, of um, digital uh, aspects or virtual, let's say, uh, um, experiences is that it enriches our experiences while we are traveling. And once again, I make the comment that this is pre-COVID, yeah, when people loved to go by by planes or by trains, especially, you know, for longer distances, and they allowed to go uh, for, for work for uh, longer distances uh, a bit more. And this, uh, the, um, um, you know, the um, um, mobile phones and the access to the internet allow them to do something like this. We are talking about the future logistics, irrespective from the production with 3D printing, you know, from we can uh, produce different, uh, different uh, components or um, um, anything that we want, you know, uh, with this technology to the delivery. Maybe we have this little green man uh, um, solution that will solve the uh, uh, last mile problem, yeah. Uh, in terms of engagement, uh, you know, with stakeholders and citizens, again, the technology may help us. We saw this year uh, how we how it works much more than it, it we uh, experienced before. There are mixed, uh, um, let's say, examples and mixed feelings about um, 
uh, about how it works. But my view is that it will work better if the technology and the, the people are better geared for two reasons. First of all, many people will uh, have access to this. Others then are regularly involved in these uh, consultations and uh, to people get better use with uh, technology. It will influence the governance. We heard uh, 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 um, Charlotte uh, earlier in the morning the importance of the role of uh, and uh, the, uh, of the role of organizations or new organizations, either local authorities or um, uh, providers for for mobility and how. Uh, uh, how we create a mechanism between them is based on trust and confidence, as I always try to say. And this is very, very important, especially after the post-COVID era. And, One more uh, minute. Thank you, and uh, thank you, Eman. And uh, just to to link up again with Charlotte, which is one of my favorite part of the of the research in uh, in create, uh, yeah, and in uh, in uh, in more too, is <clears throat> when she showed that um, that graph when. When, uh, when the cities in Create have de developed at a certain moment, that particular moment we consider that it was aligned the stars, you know, the planets were aligned. And we, are we say this in mindsets, Laurie Pickup developed this idea that the alignment of the mindset of the politicians, professionals and road users may facilitate not only the development of a vision, the implementation of different solutions, but you know the usage of uh, of different mobility uh, um, aspects. Now, in terms of a future road, uh, you know, to, to come to an end, you know, these these are the the, the majority of the the uh, uh, needs we have. Let's say uh, distilled from all the discussions and um, let's say analysis that we have made. And if you look on the uh, on the right hand side you see the categories of the road users from um, from uh, pedestrians to um, um, cycling to public transport users to car users to logistics you know and to public authorities all of them are very very much interested in in developing uh, or um, um, de having certain aspects of uh, or certain needs so I, I I will try to end here especially looking at that uh, one aspect is very important for uh, for cities as vision and validate. And Peter always said that this is the future of uh, of uh, planning. You know, we have to find that uh, um, the places. You know, the the P in in uh, in the create uh, diagram and this helpful only having this vision and validate uh, mindset. In fact, thank you very much. I think this I will stop here. And if you have some. Some questions, I'm happy to, to reply. Thank you. Thank you, Lucia. Great presentation, very dynamic, clear. Thank you for coming back to basics with uh, remind, focusing on population users, uh, stressing uh, uh, generation uh, uh, balance, tension in lifestyle, uh, looking at different uh, technologies uh, influencing behaviors, linking it to governance, which is a key element, and focusing, finalizing the presentation of this really nice chart identifying all the, the numerous needs uh, that should be accommodated by public career and public space and they probably require some sort of uh, um, some sort of selection. So thank you very much for this. Let me now uh, move, uh, welcome the, the, the second speaker, our second speaker, let's move on to the second presentation. So Meng Lu um, is a strategic innovation manager working for peak traffic in uh, Dinik, in the Netherlands. Uh, Meng is going to talk about uh, trends and challenges regarding advanced technologies for sustainable mobility. And I'd like also uh, to attract your attention on the fact that a couple of polls will be presented to the, uh, to the audience. So now you're used to uh, clicking uh, quickly and smoothly, you will have the opportunity to actually practice with three polls. Meng, the floor is yours. Thank you, Manuela, for your kind of introduction. Also, welcome everyone to the afternoon session of uh, the MORE webinar of today. Um, before I go to some details about uh, technical uh, advance, uh, advantage, uh, I first want to know your opinion about uh, some related issues. So we can start with uh, two polls. Yeah, look at the first one for uh, what's the challenge that advanced technologies may help 
to solve uh, any issues in your city. So you can choose a multiple choice, but uh, my preference is that you indicate the, the, the most important one first. If you think they are equally important, then you choose multiple choice. We'll give you several seconds from air quality to traffic efficiency to safety. So you can have additional thoughts and you can put them in the chat. You can just click on the screen and it should work. Can we get a result? Francisco? Oh, some people are so quick. You even have uh, chosen even a second one. So um, most concern is uh, traffic efficiency for the first uh, question and air quality. For the second one, uh, technical applications, uh, do you expect? Um, so a large amount of uh, uh, participants talk about automated driving. Um, so that's exactly what I want to cover. Thank you very much. We can close the poll. I will continue. So I, I gave you a quick overview of the, the observations we have seen so far. So around the 2,500 years roads development. Uh, this means, I, I mean, roads is with, with a function, with material. We think about a physical infrastructure but we are, currently we also see uh, a lot of uh, electronic things on road. We also have public lighting. You can also uh, install many other uh, sensors on road. Look at the car development, uh, more than 130 years old history, but we also see the more than 30 percent, maybe even more embedded electronics in the car already. Personal computer, we can see around 35 years. Maybe I had this uh, experience. So you still remember your first uh, uh, computer in your home, a tower computer before we use laptop. And then it becomes a communication device that's related to another uh, technical development. When we talk about telephone, so we all remember from 1G to the current 3 of 4G, currently we're using still 25 years. Uh, we're thinking about a multifunction. Seems, seems like people are, are uh, the users, of the preference is uh, to have a multiple function in, in one device. One thing changed our life, in my view, is the internet. That's 30 years uh, development. We all know this VVV, invented in, in 1918. Nine as CERN people they make it really uh, so, so for for general public we, we we can benefit from our internet. That's about connectivity. We start uh, AI here because uh, I I'm quite uh, surprised to see that uh, everyone is talking about AI th these days. Actually, it's not new. It's not technology. It's just a method. Um, this method, we know uh, expert systems, and we later on use data mining. As a researcher, we also use neural networks. At the time, it's only researchers we try, new, try to use new, new method. But currently, it seems like people think it will solve everything and everything you need AI to solve. But it's not true. AI is just a method. We should use it very carefully uh, because it's not used uh, common logic as a human being, it may uh, create a, a lot of uh, uh, invited results. So advanced technology, I uh, am talking about mainly it's about you know, uh, information and communication technologies, sensor technologies. We, we, we have absolute and relative positioning, like you use a satellite or you use a digital map. And we also think about the control technologies, material science, construction, uh, also uh, modeling uh, and data analytics. 
internet changed our society. So we have this connectivity and people always think about we will handle a huge amount of data in the future, but it might be not necessary. It depends on what, what, what's the problem we are targeting and how to solve. Quantum computing is still in the start phase. There is, uh, we know IBM is building it, um, but still it's not uh, at the practical level. We also know the, the complexity. If you, you, you have a random number, that's a tra traditional classical way of thinking, you still know the, uh, the, the random is not really random. I would say you, 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 you can still figure out what is not, but in quantum, you, you don't know. So how you validate uh, if this real quantum, quantum or not. So there are also many, many other challenges about quantum computing. Um, for automated road transport, we, we noticed that it's a high interest of the participants. I will cover this also uh, in details. I mentioned this is three dimension. This concept is not new. So we think about the future. Why not use, uh, use underground for logistics? So put all the goods transport on the ground and the people share the space uh, on, on surface, on the surface of, uh, of the road. And then we also think about uh, uh, another dimension in the air. We, we, we have seen different applications and possibilities, but we have also seen a lot of hives and uh, illusions. These are the images I just tried to show you. I know some cities also think about Hyperloop. I, I don't think it's the right way for decision makers to take it so you, because in the US people are doing something in Europe, we have to do something. Also flying taxi, flying drones or, or last uh, mile delivery by robots. Those are not where I talk about the traditional conventional industry are thinking. If you are a conventional industry, you take care of other road users. You, you should think about the safety, the certificate, authentication, authentication uh, also how to in, in, ensure security. So there are many, many uh, issues. So uh, let, let me try to cover automated driving. So automated driving, I'm talking about, is not a robot delivery. It's not about the dunes. Those are not, there, there's no regular, uh, let's say, profound uh, base yet. Even the commercial market is also questionable, depends on country, depends on city. But automated vehicle will come. If you see the illustration on the, uh, on top of the bus, uh, this is from Andalf in the Netherlands more than 10 years ago, we have unmanned bus transport from the city center to the airport. You may also see the, the, the top, uh, the, the Schiphol airport also more than 10 years ago, the shuttle transport people from parking place to the terminals. Um, you could also see some shuttles, maybe you are familiar with uh, some you funded projects, they are used also in Japan and other countries. So you see the automated driving act, we have talked about it for many years, but it's still um, is, is ongoing. When we use a term, I first clarify, currently on the market, we still only have level two. Uh, let's say level two is a partially automation. So you may have some longitudinal lateral control system, but doesn't mean uh, the, the, the driver is uh, uh, out of the loop, so the driver is in the loop until even level three. So after uh, level four, that means driver drivers are out of the, you don't need driver to take control. So that's a reason that uh, a lot of, uh, we call that OEMs, so that's the car automotive industry, they may skip level three, directly put a level four on the market. The reason is that a human reaction is slower than machine. If you, you need time to react, you also need time to take action. So from a technical perspective, it's logic to say, let's go to level four, um, but level three is that research uh, for research is important and directly go to level four. But if you go to level four, then you have a liability issue. If something went wrong, the, the human is not uh, responsible, or if the driver is not responsible, who's responsible? And if you talk about the, uh, level five, uh, there's, uh, People always think about it will come soon, but in my view, in our lifetime, it won't come. That means full automa uh, automation in any 
condition on any traffic situation. So we don't think uh, it doesn't matter which method we use, it doesn't matter which, which technology, how advanced it would be, um, uh, it, not, not in the, uh, let's say, around 100 years we can really achieve. So when we talk about automated driving, it's not uh, you can sleep in the car, it's really a step-by-step -step development. You, you, it's very comfortable. We do this not for car itself, it's for protecting pedestrian, protecting other road users, not only to protect the drivers and occupants in, in the vehicle. So that's the concept. It's not just for a fancy uh, development. When we look at automated uh, uh, automation in the future, we also think about the infrastructure. It's not just the current infrastructure is sufficient. We need vehicle to infrastructure, vehicle, vehicle, infrastructure to infrastructure communication. We also need to manage traffic. Let's say the all modes of traffic, not only cars, not only uh, the, also all the vulnerable road users in one system. When we talk about the public transport, we have ICT to support this. We will have a, a, a better data exchange communication, taking care of vulnerable road users and promote green, healthy mode. Uh, think about the multimodal transport. It's not to ban uh, one mode, just to make the system more efficient and also uh, acceptable by the users. Also think about the equality uh, of the society. And we also think about the private uh, vehicles. This, this is without investment from the pocket of the cities. Anyway, industry will do this. And we actually, we're doing this from via sensor technology and communication technology. One example is we always use the term driver assistance systems. Um, the, so the vehicles, I put them in two categories because the development marketing would be different. One is the commercial vehicle. Commercial vehicles, not only uh, the freight transport for goods, you can also think about long distance coaches. And so we call them the intelligent transport systems. So these uh, systems, including autonomous system, cooperative system, we have uh, developed for uh, around 40 years. Basically, it's for road safety, traffic efficiency, energy efficiency, environment, and the comfort. My slide is a bit slow. Yeah, I want to put the oh, Francisco. The third one, you need to page down, I guess. Francisco, I see the uh, first and the second and not the third. It's, uh, it's the one at the end. So if you scroll down, you see it at the end. Okay. So I guess uh, uh, people online just to scroll down, if you go see the third one, what's the main concern of your city? Uh, think about the technologies may help you. When you select something, first things pop up is cybersecurity, so is data privacy, or it's just the functionality, user friendliness. Um, you can choose uh, uh, multiple answers, but I prefer that you only do that when you think they're equally important. Francisco, I think you can show the results. Um, so you only you also need to scroll down. Uh, so uh, people, most of people think of functionality. That's a basic requirements. That's understandable. Uh, but also some concerns about cybersecurity and data privacy. Uh, I will leave your uh, people who selected other for the th uh, all the three questions. I leave them in the end of this uh, presentation. Thank you, Francisco. I close this and continue my presentation. Five more minutes, Ming. Yeah. I don't know why I can't move my screen. Yeah. I don't think about the uh, traffic. I always uh, think about there's, if there's congestion, the capacity is insufficient, I can do optimization, I can do uh, control, and then I may increase capacity, reduce con congestion, and also benefit for fuel consumption. But in the long term, people, 
behavior may change. They would say, oh, there's no traffic jam, then I will use more car. I, I will use car for, for travel. So then you may create more. So it's a question, is the traffic management a nonsense for sustainable development? Uh, but actually, from an engineering perspective, we always try to say what type of model we should use, what type of data we, we do use, and we really we distinguish fluid or recurrent or congestions, or if it's just uh, caused by incidents or other. I'll give you an example that uh, some projects I'm working uh, with really to automate the driving and also to really to those space. So if you look at the city uh, uh, area, so for automated vehicle, we also think about in the future, it's not just an autonomous system. That means only you, you have your own radar sensor. You do need infrastructure to detect or other vehicles using other vehicles infrastructure additional sensor to detect things that the vehicle may not be able to see. So in this case, you can see a right turn situation. So the pedestrian may, may go through, but the vehicle may not see the pedestrian. But the, the, the vehicle in the north uh, upcoming may detect this pedestrian. I may send a message to, to the turning vehicle. So this is uh, the, the one of the solutions. We could also think about a vehicle, vehicle can talk which to each other, vehicle infrastructure, vehicle vulnerable roaders can talk with each other. You can also uh, have this then change the situation to be solved. We, uh, all the technologies we're using is not only for cars. We also think about it for, for cyclists, for pedestrians. Pedestrian, you, you, we could also have this cooperative system to, to, to let people feel comfortable to go across the road or get information where, uh, what, which things are deliver, delivered. So communication technology generally where, where you, you can use this short range dedicated communication, you can also use uh, cellular based communication. Another concern with automated driving is that if you we may have heard the term domain, so if you have automated vehicles coming, so let's say higher level, above level uh, three, so if it's a level four, so people may do the second task, then you may not be uh, aware that maybe uh, it's a traffic jam ahead, maybe this uh, a parking or road work or something else, or, or just uh, uh, from different circum circumstances, you can't, you can't keep high level automation. So what we, we, technically we can say, I gave it a warning, so let the driver take over the control, what if the drivers didn't take, could not wake up, what should we do? So this time we say, if this is the field, we call that the min minimum risk of maneuver, then the vehicle should automatically stop in the lane. That's by current ISO standard. But that's a problem for the city. We don't want automated vehicle if something may happen just to stand still in the street or any parking slot or somewhere else. So this needs to be defined to, to, to be regulated. And also for, I gave a quick overview of the, the services we are talking about. You may have, think about urban parking, give information, give reservation uh, possibilities. You can also have different warning systems. You can have uh, also uh, uh, for, for, for vehicles, also a warning for uh, vulnerable road users. You can have different priorities uh, for different uh, types of groups. You may have a flexible infrastructure to, to change the function even, uh, or not only the lane uh, direction change. You have in-vehicle signage to give all the information to the driver instead of putting all the signs on road. Of course, legally you have to put the signs on road, but you, you, your, your drivers may have better information. And you may have uh, different, uh, uh, you, you can get advice for different modes, different trip, that's for all travelers, not only for cars. We also have uh, collected some uh, uh, data, let's see, a kind of meta-analysis we have done for uh, the benefits of technology. This is uh, from literature, we can see quite a lot is for safety, but it also has benefit for fuel consumption and CO2 reduction. And solutions, I would always say this is always, nothing's black and white. The, this decision making is complicated. When we think, talk about sustainability, it's not only environmental issues, it's also safety and many others. 
But that doesn't mean if you do to reduce the CO2, you, you, you just use EV. EV is not, doesn't mean green or clean. Look at the energy source. First question, if you use your where how, how the battery is built, how the battery is recycled. So many, many other things. So we don't want to solve one problem and create new ones. Concerning technical challenges, we always talk about the security issue. So will quantum computing really solve it? Uh, probably not, because security, you, you hacker can always find a way to enter, not only via the security code, you can also bribe somebody just to enter the system. That that we have no way to, to, to solve. And also data privacy, that may also create a, some other, um, let's say the, uh, if you say we don't know your data, but you say, yeah, I don't want to give you data. I change my mind to kind of remove it. If you say I don't, I don't know who I collect data from whom. How you can guarantee you deleted the, the right one from the one? And also, uh, uh, AML won't solve uh, everything. Also, three D printing won't solve the logistics problem fundamentally. And bank, please. Um, I think I can go to conclusion. So uh, we have uh, different possibilities to implement different uh, uh, advantages, but we also see the role of infrastructure will play an important role. Um, mobility as a service, we will we, we implement it and we have implemented it. everything will uh, be better. We also hope uh, in the end, future mobility will uh, ICT will contribute to future future mobility and also to our future traffic management. That's, uh, I close here, so I take up some questions. Thank you very much, Meng. Really great presentation. More based on technology uh, compared to the previous one. Thank you for your clarity about uh, technology raising a question such as technology versus hypes and, and illusions. Thank you for your. Uh, um, let's say uh, insight on automated driving. On the, thank you for sharing your reflection on traffic management. Thank you for also, uh, let's say, leading interesting conclusions on how technology plus and minuses avoiding, uh, let's say, complementary or negative impacts could be used for road space management. Thanks for this. Uh, let's move on now to our third speaker, Peter Peter Jones, um, who has uh, turn kindly turn on his uh, his video on. So. Um, um, Peter is a scientific research coordinator at the MORE project, and Peter is going to talk about uh, possible ways of using scenarios to plan for an uncertain future. So now we're going to look at how we project ourselves in the future. We had some uh, uh, sociological dimension, technical dimension. Now, how do we predict ourselves? Peter, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Emmanuel. Can you see my screen okay? Yes. Great. Okay. <clears throat> so cities are increasingly addressing the challenge of how do you plan for the future when we know that things are uncertain and therefore more cities are beginning to use scenarios. So I briefly want to introduce this to you now. Historically, what tends to have happened is that cities have um, made future forecasts um, based on one set of numbers and use that as a basis for investment planning in new transport infrastructure. <clears throat> now, while we need forecasts, the one thing we know is they're inevitably wrong. And they tend to be wrong for two reasons. One is because they're based on extrapolations of past behavioral relationships. And we know that the future is not necessarily a, a linear extrapolation of the past, but we don't know what it is going to be. And secondly, the key input variables that uh, forecast future overall levels of demand are particularly things like population employment growth that are very difficult to estimate and again, are invariably wrong. And they also constrain thinking. Um, because if we rely on our forecasts to be the basis for our future planning, then essentially the models and our forecasts determine what we provide, as opposed to a situation where um, the city, with its citizens and politicians, decides on the future, future vision and then uses the forecasts or the model to validate a set of um, measures that will actually deliver that outcome. So scenarios provide a way of addressing these problems in an open way and help can cities prepare for the unexpected, such as, for example, COVID. I'm going to illustrate a couple of these points now. The first uh, figure here is from the UK, uh, put together by Phil Goodwin, um, and looks from 1965 up to 2035 at the different forecasts that were made in different points in time. 
The solid line, this is uh, total forecast uh, road traffic in Great Britain. The solid line, sort of dark line, is what's actually happened up until 2015. The lines that go off that are the forecasts that were made in different points of time, but what they thought the future would be like. And you can see that each of those forecasts from 1989 right up to 2011 uh, seriously overestimated the, um, the amount of traffic that we'd see on our roads in the future, partly because uh, of uh, population growth not being at the level of for being forecast, but also because of changes in uh, travel behaviour and things like that. The second thing I referred to was the use of uh, models, where they were using them essentially to predict or to validate. Uh, and the little diagram there in the top suggests that um, traditionally we would have made one future forecast for traffic levels or travel demand or whatever. We know that uh, in fact the future is uncertain, so we can uh, do a certain amount by having uh, some, uh, do some sensitivity testing, but also potentially then look at different scenarios. So we can use scenarios as by looking at differences in uh, population, employment, et cetera, as a way of looking at what future travel demand might be like. But the problem then is if you, if you produce those different scenarios and those different plans, the future is so uncertain in this example, you're not sure whether traffic's going to grow or decline. So how can you make a major investment decision on that basis? The second approach is, is one based on vision and validate, where effectively the city decides on what its future vision, in, vision is and what its targets are for modal share, things like that, and then um, comes up with a set of measures that will deliver that outcome, policy measures. But then because the future is uncertain, uses the scenarios to see what would happen um, if population grew faster or slower, whatever, and what you would need to do to get back on track to achieve the vision that you want to achieve. So essentially, there's two different ways of using scenario. What, the first one and the earlier one was really to come up with alternative futures. How might the future develop depending on the pace of technology, etc., out of which might be uh, come a preferred vision. But the second thing is to look at uh, scenarios as alternative variations in the sets of external pressures which will make it easier or more difficult for the city to achieve their desired vision. Here's an example from New Zealand of the first type of scenario that was developed um, looking at two different dimensions um, to what extent behavior will be done physically or virtually on the horizontal axis and the whether energy will be low cost or high cost and out of that those four quadrants you come out with different potential futures. The second approach is using them differently. So as I say, you have a current situation on the left, you have a vision of where you want the city to be in the future, um, and you develop a strategy, what, what you think is the best way of achieving the outcome you want. And if the city uh, develops in a particular way because of population, GDP, et cetera, then strategy will actually get you where you want to go. But if you think of it as two magnets, if, if the city gets pulled in a different way because of COVID or things like that, your strategy can go badly off track and not get you where you want to go. But if you do scenario planning, you can then take account of that possibility and then think what corrective action would you have to take to achieve the vision that you want to achieve. The way I think of it is think of a ship, a sailing ship going across uh, from one port to another. You know the port it wants to get to at the end, but on the way, the wind and the wave directions may change and therefore you may have to tack in a different direction to get to your final point. And that's the, the second uh, use of scenarios. Um, we have a deliverable uh, future scenarios for 10 feeder routes on the website www.roadspace.eu and we advise cities on different ways that they might uh, develop uh, vision, uh, develop new scenarios rather. One is to start with the city vision uh, and the environment as a starting point. Uh, secondly, go on from that and actually explore what the different drivers of change might be that might affect your ability to achieve your vision. And thirdly, you could start from a simple list of possibilities. And just here, I briefly illustrate the cities that haven't really done, uh, got a, a advanced modeling capability. They can ex start exploring these different things on here. Things like population, uh, level of wealth, social norms, et cetera, likely future developments in the cost of transport and so on. These are the sorts of things that might live, uh, influence overall level and patterns of demand in the future. Now, each of our five more cities uh, have adopted uh, the scenario approach and adapted it to their local conditions. So that's Budapest, Constanza, Lisbon, London and Melbourne. And in the next presentation, 
um, we'll hear from London about the scenario work that they've done uh, and are applying as part of the MORE project. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter, for this flash and uh, quick and very uh, clear presentation. Thank you for uh, uh, talking about this, uh, bringing us some, let's say, theoretical background. It reminds me of the phrase that John Maynard Keynes, who I think was a neighbor of UCL, used to say, we tend to, grow to forecast based uh, um, on the past. So um, I think it's a very interesting thing. Thank you for uh, uh, also presenting different appro approaches, predict and provide, vision and validate. Also, uh, presenting the, the great work that has been done in more. And actually, let's move on now to uh, the fourth and last uh, speaker, um, Tom Price, who's going to uh, talk about uh, uh, a specific case study, as you mentioned, Peter, the case study of, uh, of London. So uh, um, Tim Price um, is a demand forecasting and analytics manager, and he works for the uh, uh, Transport Organizing Authority, TFL. And then Tim is going to focus on how forecasting has been implemented in London. So uh, happy to hear from uh, the London experience team. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, for, for that. Uh, can you see the, the screen and yes, we um, can. Yes. hear me? Okay, it's all, all right. Uh, yeah, so um, I'm going to through what we've been uh, doing in, in London uh, with our scenario planning work as uh, as peter's uh, rightly said uh, um coronavirus we, we, we sort of developed scenario a lot of our scenario thinking before uh, all of this had had happened um but um it, it was an excellent opportunity to sort of uh, uh tack and change change course um towards our our vision um uh, the, the mayor's vision for, for the city um so You've heard a little bit about scenario planning from Peter, so I won't dwell on this slide um, too much. But how, how we see it is that um, scenarios are, are varied stories about um, how London um, may change in, in the future, and they and they help us to, to operate in this in this world of, of uncertainty. Um, right now we're we're dealing with the economic and um, travel behaviour uncertainty. Um, and that's affecting not just transport in London, but but all all aspects of of, of London, uh, London's li uh, life in London. As an organisation, um, we need to uh, deliver the mayor's transport strategy uh, with this sort of key goal of having 80% of of travel being made by uh, active, efficient, and sustainable modes. Um, and uh, these five scenari scenarios help us to look at this challenge and how we we get towards that. Uh, so we had to to act pretty quickly um uh, nothing like a, a pandemic to to focus the minds on on scenarios um and we needed to uh to have a look at some of the key drivers um uh going back really to the the, the start of the the process as peter had had described and we produced five uh, plausible scenarios um uh, for the implications of covid-19 on on travel um, and that kind of considers how how quickly uh, that this current crisis dissipates and the speed and, and nature of, of the economic recovery, um, how uh, practices of work in shopping leisure um, may indeed change in in the medium term, uh, and how ch how London's place in the world um, may have impact on on population uh, demographics and and jobs. Um, and in all, all these scenarios are plausible, and it's obviously not just limited to, to five, but you have to, to pick a number. Um, and we are considering a 2030 time frame. Um, so it's a, sort of uh, a, a, a 10 year, nine years now um, uh, scenario, though we, we have also uh, done some work on, on longer um, time frames to, to 2041, uh, which is when the, the um, uh, mayor's transport strategy is is sort of yeah that that's that's the, the the year that we're aiming there and we've done some longer term um, scenarios there that you may well have heard uh, Peter or Roshin talk about before. So the five scenarios, um, I shall really quickly sort of explain what what they are. The one one option is a, a return to to business as usual, probably a somewhat unlikely uh, scenario really, but it it is there uh, where London sort of bounce backs quickly and and we we carry on with our lives as as normal 
and the middle one here is London Fenster itself, um, with lower growth in London, um, and and uh, you know a little bit of a fallout from the virus and and uh, you know the, the impact of uh, other political decisions recently uh, means that, that London is a little bit more isolated and there's some challenges there. Another alternative is co low carbon localism. Um, it's a smaller but sustainable London. Um, the, the, the virus has had an impact on people and they began to think a little bit more locally. Uh, remote revolution uh, is, is akin to a lot of, a lot of the sort of high tech scenarios. Um, technology is really changing London. And then finally, we have agglomeration, 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 which is the um, a hypercharged uh, London, but ends up as a very unequal London where there's there's clear winners and losers. So scenarios provide us a range of, of outcomes across the, the, the factors. There's an awful lot here, but if I just uh, uh, group them into uh, clearly the, the, the virus impact, um, will will that be uh, sort of quick or, or are there, are there uh, longer term impacts? Um, government uh, response, uh, which could be a, a whole range of, of, of uh, outcomes really from the UK government. Uh, economic impact uh, quite how London and, and the rest of the UK economy and European economy in fact um, uh, uh, comes out of this whether it's uh, back to growth or, or um, challenge and, and, and inequality. Challenges, changes in travel uh, behaviour uh, depending on whether people are, are deciding to remote work more or, or increase rates commuting. A lot of the scenarios are obviously towards the remote working but with um, business as usual being right down the center uh, and then sort of wider changes in mobility and 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 these are things at the bottom um so you can see uh return to business as usual sort of hits down down the middle each time um but uh, uh dependent on um uh where uh depend on the sort of the factor uh different scenarios uh, end up scales here um and you can see it's not just a case of um everything's uh, to the left um, and things to, to the right. There's a, there's, a, there's a variety there, to just dependent on on what's most appropriate. Um, so we've quantified these, um, and here's a, uh, the, the the kind of key uh, outcomes. Uh, the, the return to business of, of of usual is what what we had sort of been planning for before. Really, it's back to the 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 we can start to say the London plan rather than the draft London, which is nice, that's, that's now um, all ratified, which is uh, good. And it's a relatively quick economic recovery. London retains its, its position. And there's this continuing mode shift towards rail and a reduction in, in car ownership. Uh, London fence for itself, um, you can see on, on, on the right hand side, the impact on, on uh, rail and, and bus. Um, and uh, uh, but then uh, uh, in the opposite direction for, for car and driver. Um, just a, a preference for private transport modes, uh, decline in London's place uh, in the world, um, and a sort of a, a general rebalance away from London. Um, oh, have we lost, missed out to the scenarios, Anoli? Uh, OK, um, well, I'll, we haven't got much time anyway, so I'll just talk about agglomeration, 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 where you can see uh, the numbers are a lot more more positive, particularly for, for, for public transport, uh, the economy bouncing back um, with, with gusto um, and uh, sort of um, uh, some marginal increases in remote working, but not, not substantially um, and sort of big increases, particularly in, in, in rail. Uh, so. Uh, just to talk about uh, low carbon localism, uh, this is less travel generally, um, uh, but uh, of, of the of, of if we think about the modes, um, that was um, more car car driver, but but a, a little bit more um, walking in in that scenario as well, and the other one, remote revolution, um, uh, as you can imagine, um, less. Uh, a lot less uh, commuting, um, which means that the um, the rail and bus um, uh, growth is is lower than than business as usual. Um, so, at this point in the pandemic, um, there's still a broad range of these scenarios. Uh, we don't really know which one of it's going to uh, going to go, or indeed 
where it's going to hit in, in, in that range. Um, generally speaking, an uh, increase in active travel is likely across all the, all the scenarios, so various influence in this and population growth and the locality, um, avoiding crowding. Um, London is thinking a little bit differently to, to how they might have thought um, in the uh, in, in the past, which is great for the for the strategy to to, to, to have a a population that is is travelling um, sustainably and efficiently. Um, rail growth is is volatile. That's obviously important for for transport for London, um, uh, but there's also scenarios where where it recovers uh, um, a lot better, uh, and there is this risk of, of an enhanced sort of car. Uh, recovery, uh, which would be uh, very bad news for for parts of outer London, and, and particularly when we think about um, street space um, and 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 the, and the challenges there. Um, so, yeah, just to say, it's important to keep the scenarios relevant and track London's recovery. We may find we look at a graph and all those five scenarios in one one corner, and uh, and what happens to London is in a completely different corner. But um, uh, perhaps not. Uh, so, yeah, just one final thing to say that we're using these scenarios to uh, help with the mayor's transport strategy uh, to make sure that we have an inclusive and green recovery. Um, uh, we, as a city, obviously are very keen on on um, avoiding any large scale increase in in car usage, um, and we we want to do what we can to to uh, change our course to to get to there really. Um, it's good to focus on, on walking and cycling, uh, but at the same time, we need to ensure that public transport um, continues to play a significant role um, in uh, sustaining that increase in sustainable uh, recovery. Um, so, our, so this is a little bit hot off the press and been um, chatting with our, our um, seniors and, and to the, the wider industry, and our key sort of conclusions are we need to plan for the factors that are, are prevalent in, in a lot of these scenarios, uh, mitigate against these risks, and review our, our investment decisions um, when the future is uh, not yet clear. Um, so thank you very much. I shall stop sharing at the end of the presentation. Thank you, Tim. Great presentation. Uh, thank you for uh, presenting uh, <clears throat> the, the London approach. The, the questions uh, that uh, uh, are raised uh, by TFL, I think are very interesting questions. They are certainly shared by many others, uh, transport authorities or forecasters or consultants or academics. So thank you for this really great, uh, great vision. And also what is interesting with the, among many other things, right? Um, is this a forecast really can encompass a political dimension and the political vision of the future. And I'd like to stress what you, what you said at the end, among other things, there's a big fear that uh, there's a return or come back of the car. So actually, the, that's a kind of a, at least, uh, um, let's say, assumption that we all share as a not acceptable solution. And then we have to project ourselves in a flexible and multi, uh, multi way to, let's say, deal with this future. Thank you. Uh, great. So we are, we're, we're, we're on time, um, two minutes ahead of the, uh, of, of, uh, of our schedule. So I suggest that we move on now to the uh, round table. Uh, so thank you for all the speakers for their great presentation. Happy to, to see your, your, your face there. Uh, just maybe uh, to, before, we, before I start sharing one or two questions, depending on the time we have and the type of question, I'd just like to have a, um, maybe uh, to share what has been uh, uh, some discussion that went on in the, in the chat and uh, on one on one hand side, there are the, let's say, the uh, skeptical technological skeptical types, skeptical types of, uh, let's say, uh, uh, statements. Uh, we should go for fewer car, cars is a mistake. Uh, the, and on the other hand, we have those who maybe have a, a more, let's say, uh, optimistic approach of technology, but still questioning it. Can we think about uh, battery, make, uh, can we make battery more sustainable? Can we transform uh, battery uh, and can we transform the car to make it a bit more adapted to uh, city environment, et cetera, et cetera. So we have this debate in the chat and I think it's the perfect, maybe um, perfect time uh, to raise the, maybe the first question, which is about, uh, let's say this, this, this position or the place we would like to give to, to technology, right? And I'd like to ask you, 
uh, from your experience, city experience, so that's open to all speakers, city experience, work experience, what is your perception of, let's say, the conscious consciousness of development of new technology? Is there an appetite for this? Uh, is there an appetite for, for this among the public, among the politicians, among decision makers, or is it just something which is, uh, uh, let's say, cornerized in, in, in the sector of, of specialist and, and technological geek? And um, second aspect of this is uh, if there is some kind of interest for this, what kind of, uh, let's say, regulation or, 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 or exemplary regulation we could think about as far as all these technological solutions are, are concerned. So dear, dear speakers, the, the floor is yours for this, for this question. And I, I've seen that Peter has ri risen his hand. So maybe Peter, you'd like to, to start? Um, I actually did so because I wanted to quickly comment on Tim's, if I may do that just very briefly, and then I'll go and answer the question. I think there are two, I hadn't seen Tim's presentation before, as I say, it's, it's very recent work that's been done by TfL. I, I think there are two things that come out of the scenarios. One is that some future investments will turn out to be valuable under most of those scenarios. So then you have more confidence to do those because uh, under different futures, it still looks like a good bet. And the other thing is a bit like my analogy of the ship. I mean, the scenarios show you how the winds and waves may take you in different directions. And then with that information, you look at how you might modify your policy measure mix in order to try and get you back on track. But this is very much live work. And I think it shows how useful the scenarios are for facing up to an uncertain future. I mean, to answer your question now, Emmanuel, um, I think the technology comes uh, in different ways, doesn't it? Um, a lot of it is driven uh, by the private sector in order to offer consumers new products. And some of these come in amazing, uh, amazingly easily, you know, over a few years, the smartphone has totally transformed many, most people's lives, not only in, in Europe, but also in parts of Africa and so on. Uh, and that's, that's come in quite easily. I'm not saying technology wasn't difficult, but it's been accepted quite easily. Um, other things people are much more cautious about, like autonomous vehicles and so on. Um, so I think if the products are there to benefit individuals and they don't have any wider knock-on effects, I think they come in quite easily. But something like autonomous vehicles, which you might like to have um, as a private consumer or driver, but you might not like the consequences of that as a citizen when they're there en masse, so I think it depends. If the technology benefits you with no external potential negative effects, I think it goes in quite smoothly. If the aggregate effects of individual behaviour could be detrimental, then I think it becomes a, a, you know, a more a political and, and, and national or uh, city level issue that needs to be debated. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Meng, would you like to bring some compliments? Yeah, uh, I, I thank for for uh, the comments and uh, the questions posted uh, uh, by the participants. I, I like your your questions. I, I think what Peter and uh, uh, the teachers covered is is a behavior issue. Uh, I, as a citizen, I find it extremely bizarre to see people stand on the escalator. Why you stand there? Why not walk? And also, when we think about it, uh, we can provide a lot of things. Even when we invite a car, is to uh, automate the driver is to correct human errors because we see uh, nearly 100% uh, accidents are due to human errors. So we try to correct them from technical perspective. But people drink and dr drive; they're against the rule, and they, they drive or they're speeding or whatever. So those things you can't really from technical. Of course, technically we can do it, but legally maybe we we are not allowed to do. So I, I think fundamentally is the behavior may impact. Uh, the, the, the result, not the technology itself, like ITS. So we all have navigation systems nowadays that we're benefited from it without knowing, uh, without noticing anything. Also safety is not just uh, accident, I fully agree, it's, uh, it's about the risk, is to avoid conflict points. It's about how to reduce the consequence, also how to reduce the exposure. So how to use a car is important than uh, how we develop the car. Technically, we can solve a lot of things, but we can't uh, uh, really make 100% sure that people may behave in another way to misuse the technology. Thank you. Thanks, Meng. Thank you. So, Chia, would you like to uh, share your views on this? Just, just a quick one. I think you, you can't put, um, I say, a limit of uh, 
how much you want to develop technologies. You know, the technologies will be developed, you know, irrespective of our wish or not, of what we need or not. You know, this is the, the issue, you know, and this is what we are seeing. The interesting, uh, what I am interested in is how the, tele, uh, the technology or, or the results of the technology, you know, the products that the technologies may, may develop, you know, how will they be used, you know, and how will they put more pressure on what exists at this moment, one. And secondly, how the, uh, the public authorities will cope with uh, regulating and uh, in, in um allowing them in the mix of of a mobility solution at this moment it is very difficult at this particular moment as you you notice in uh, dealing with um different mobility providers that are popping up you know the private ones you know and it's very very difficult which is great but in the same time it's we have to find the right mix of how to collaborate so technology won't have a, an, a limit you know in developing you know it's it's the future you know for what it's in the human nature you know to to aspire for something else, you know, but I think uh, it, it's up to us what we, how we use the technology and to take that particular part of the technology for what we need. Thank you, Lucia. Tim, would you like to contribute? Would you have any? Yeah, uh, so from uh, my perspective as, uh, as, as a model, we're always trying to, to, to think of, of how we can sort of um, plan for this and and, uh, and 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 think about how technologies can, how we can uh, plan for the future and and, and get um, consider these these uh, new new modes and new new technologies within within um, our our models. Um, it's all, all quite often quite often a challenge because um, the models frequently need sort of. Uh, uh, data on on what's happened in, in the past as 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 uh, has been alluded to before. So so uh, yeah, it's it's often the case of of, of, of um, uh, a little bit of a little bit of guesswork, a little bit of research relying on academic studies and and uh, uh, and and of course asking people um, you know what, what they will how they will react um, to, to different technologies and and, uh, and and leaving space with, with within our models to, to be able to uh, uh, to be able to, to, to forecast for that. So a little less on, on, on the governance, but how, how we we uh, sort of use it in, in uh, our other mind models to think about these these things. Thanks Tim. I think all the four uh, speakers have stressed the, the link or the interaction between the introduction of technology and uh, let's say the way uh, the social body integrates it, the way we regulate it, the way we, 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 we identify the different impacts. And, and, and I'm sure we'll, we'll certainly have more opportunity to discuss this because uh, it's, uh, it's not a closed subject. So thank you for this. We have a few more minutes. I'd like maybe to um, share with you, uh, let's say a second question, which is um, we, we had some, uh, some great presentation uh, about forecasting, about technology, and also about uh, social analysis. We know that uh, COVID has been a sort of a disruptor, if I may put it that way, of our, let's say, business as usual, our understanding of uh, trends, our vision of things. So maybe uh, we could spend a few minutes for, for each speaker um, to, to, let's say, share your views on how COVID have, how COVID can or will impact uh, our perception, um, our understanding uh, and our tools, uh, forecasting tools. May I start by Peter? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, I think two or three things. First of all, it's a bit like an earthquake, isn't it? That, that pressure builds up on a fault line and suddenly it releases. And, and you can see that in some senses, what COVID has done is to accelerate trends already there in terms of, for example, uh, online shopping and things like that. And, and maybe even, I think a lot of people have wanted to work from home, but their employers have been very suspicious about that and they've held it back. And now there's been no choice. They can see that in some industries, it actually works very well. Um, and for example, um, some organizations, BP, for example, have said that they uh, only expect they'll need 60% of the office space when people go back to work because some people will be working from home. 
So some of it is about accelerating existing trends. So in, in, in a way they perhaps um, you know, could be anticipated to some extent in the model. I think the second thing that's happened is, is to actually change uh, priorities and perceptions. So for example, um, very interestingly, certainly in the UK may not be true in other countries, but the housing market has changed quite dramatically. Uh, and, and places one to 200 kilometers for London, the more desirable properties have shot up in price. Um, and in fact, in, in central in London, the house prices have stayed or have gone down because people have realized that they could work more from home and therefore they'd rather be in a much more pleasant environment and not on a very congested underground train every day or something like that. Coupled with the fact also that uh, in, in a large city like London, the center is completely dead. Um, but when you go to more of the suburban uh, centers, they're very, they're thriving. So people have learned partly through choice um, and partly through necessity to make more use and, and discover their local facilities. So a move towards localization of daily life is not an extrapolation of existing trend, but it may be a consequence of it. So some of the things I think it's just speeding up of existing trends, other things potentially are giving people insights into different ways of living and, and may uh, revive localization, plus a greater, greater emphasis on place, public spaces, greenery. And Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Men? Yeah. Uh, I would say mo mobility from technical perspective, our goal is to uh, in improve sustainability. Sustainability from uh, three dimensions, not only environmental, also safety and efficiency. And this comes up to the decision making issue. So what, how, how, what, what is the, the, the process? It's just that you listen to a lobby group or you have sufficient knowledge because the system is so complicated. I think a COVID actually bring us a good opportunity to rethink about our life. Now we understand what is the minimum needs and requirements for living. Maybe we also are thinking about what is the minimum needs or requirements for life. What is the quality of life? We want economic growth. We want more than we should, probably. People are more greedy than in the past. It's not a technology may bring anything wrong. It's our behavior, it's our way of thinking, it's our lifestyle. That's something I want to address. Thank you. Great, man. Thank you very much. Lucia? Yeah, I, I I agree with everything that it was said. It was it, it I, I I I think what we have observed, you know, because we, we started to 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 look into what are the trends during COVID and uh, anticipate what is after the COVID, you know, the majority of them, you know, are the same uh, the, the same, you know, because that the, the COVID influences us in three ways, you know, generally, you know, like if we talk about mobility, you know, of the passenger uh, demand, uh, you know, uh, the social economic inequality, if we use e-commerce or not, or on the behavior way, again, if we uh, work in a flexible way, when we know, we knew that uh, it was in the past, in the, in, in the past, we, we, toyed with the idea to work from home and now it's, it's we we see that it's possible you know what uh, if we are uh, we were um, a travel safety conscious you know now we are even more you know we wanted a healthier lifestyle we saw this this trend you know coming you know it's we, it's accelerated like uh, and emphasized like peter said earlier and on technology, we, we don't say anymore because the digitalization and the, 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 the different the forms of mobility services and products will be accepted. What I did, I, I did see and I, we didn't predict for them is how actually the, the city space will change in order to accommodate this one. So the, the city topology, topology info, uh, transformation is one of the trends that we have to look into and as, as a general aspect. And the, at the same time is how we see the trip, you know, how we look at the trip. Before, for us, it was very important the cost of a trip. Now it's not important. It's important the safety and how we, we, we get from A to B in a, in a safer way, you know. So therefore the, the spacing and timing, yeah, because we, we want to avoid the peak hours, you know, it's very important. And this influences the type of trips we are doing, the type of jobs we are doing, the type of medical facilities, the type of homes or ho housing we, we have to take into the future. So these are the, the things that I, I'm looking. And from the perspective, 
perspective of, of, uh, of the local authorities, I think exactly like we discussed, they have to understand their roles, you know, the, of the regulators or framing the, the, the um, let's say, the, the, the new rules, you know, in uh, accepting new mobility systems and their components and enabling this new mobility actors that are popping up, you know. So I think the COVID, uh, Peter said that is in, uh, you know, it, uh, it, 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 in a way it's a blessing in disguise. It allows us to stop for a moment and take a, 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 a nice fresh view of what we really want from life. Like Meng said, what is our quality of life, how we want to live our life, yeah. Thanks, Lucia. And one minute for Tim, if you'd like to say something on that. Before we come to the conclusion, yeah, I'll, I'll pair it off of I'll, I'll pair it off of that that final point actually because it was the first thing that, that I wrote down actually is that sort of uh, reassessment of um, uh, of our priorities in 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 life and whether that's work life balance or whether it's what you want from from your transport system or whether in fact you uh, the environment or, or or the economy is uh, in these sessions. Um, people have that opportunity to to think about um, what's important, and um, uh, and as as planners of a, of a city, city um, we, we live in it, but also recognise it as well. As far as understanding is uh, concerned, um, it's been uh, a, a godsend really for 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 us as as planners to be able to give an example of of how um, how the world can fundamentally. Um, Change and 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 uh, whereas before sort of scenarios were, were, were just a, a a concept and maybe you might be able to sort of suggest well this might happen you can you can sort of uh, get politicians and and and, and policymakers to understand you know that that um, epoch changing things can happen and they can happen extremely quickly uh, and just on 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 tools. Um, you know, we, we've got tools we've been able to, to use, but we've also had to sort of reassess them and see what's the best use, um, how to best use and how to, to use um, uh, more uh, detailed aggregate, uh, disaggregate models, um, exploring uh, whether we want to look at sort of the agent rather than just um, the strategic models. So um, it's been a very interesting year for, for, for our, our modeling tools as well. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tim. Thank you, everyone. Great, great uh, discussion. I think we have uh, we have now come to the end of this uh, of this discussion. Just uh, maybe one one comment, which makes us realize that transport, uh, public space, etc., is a tool at the service of something else. That is to say, us humans, us being our lives, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think it's something important, and probably one conclusion that come out that comes out of this uh, discussion. So let me thank all the participants, of course, the speakers from all, Lucia, Ming, Peter, Tim. Uh, who are highly committed uh, uh, into this very interesting and, and well-managed uh, project. Thank you very much. Thank you for the thank you to our colleagues also from police and in particular Francesco, who was the invisible hand uh, uh, behind this. Uh, presentations and uh, recording will be made available. Um, details will be provided soon uh, in a follow-up email. Let me also uh, inform, and I will finish on that, uh, that uh, we're not going to stay there. We plan to hold a later event um, to present um, the work that has been done by uh, cities member of the uh, Moore uh, Consortium uh, on developing new street designs uh, tools. So uh, we'll be happy to uh, update that. So uh, uh, please uh, cancel this in your, in your agenda as soon as we get the, uh, the save the date. So that's about it. Uh, that's the end of the session. Thank you, everyone. Have a nice day. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye. 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 Bye, everyone. Nice to see you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.